Okay, then um, to continue with content density estimation, I will first want to prove that I'm right. Um, so this is uh, the Ethan L. Payden book on machine learning, Introduction to Machine Learning. It's actually quite good. I only uh, discovered it recently because I always had this Bishop Barbara Murphy trias of machine learning books on my mind, which are very good books, but they are um, probabilistic and there is a lot of stuff in machine learning that's not probabilistic because people don't want to get into the complexities of probability theory and this is kind of a le little less biased um, in the probabilistic or Bayesian uh, framework of machine learning so it's a very good book um, I think as an introduction to machine learning machine learning not data mining and it has a section on non-parametric methods and in this non-parametric methods um, there's density estimation um, using histograms so in machine learning, they can't afford the proper cardinality sign, so they need hashtags. But otherwise, this is exactly what we are discussing right now. And it's machine learning. So we are also cool here. It's not only on Thursdays where things are cool, but also on Mondays. Sorry. Um, so um, now we want to introduce a kernel density estimation as um, just shown but first we need to oops so we need to go back to my um, lecture oops that's not the lecture So kernel density estimation, it also, um, kernel density estimation is quite well to understand from um, a graphical viewpoint and we will do this, but first, um, yeah, let's look into the technical aspects of it. Um, so it's a little bit um, on first sight, if you see the kernel density estimator, um, it's less clear why this should be an estimator and in which sense of a probability density compared to the histogram. Because with the histogram you're familiar, you count what's in the number of bins, you normalize appropriately, so you divide by the number of um, ST, um, uh, observations and by the bin width. Uh, the kernel density estimator is a little bit more involved and it comes also with the um, um, yeah, side condition that uh, the kernels that you use are, for example, the Gaussian kernel or um, the Cauchy kernel, and it's easy to get confused there that um, you think that you somehow estimate any probability density with a Gaussian, which is not at all the case. It's just the smoothing kernel, but um, yeah, one needs to pay a little bit more attention in kernel density estimation to understand why um, the kernel density estimator that has actually been proposed by Parson and Rosenblatt in kind of the late 60s, um, why this works as a probability density function estimator. So um, because it's a little bit more involved, I have um, here a little bit of an um, overview before we um, um, go into it. Um, so kernel density estimation again aims to estimate an unknown PDF, but now with a continuous function in, uh, call, um, in, in contrast to the histogram, which is of course not continuous because you have these steps always at the bin uh, edges. And now you want to estimate a PDF, um, so better need to um, get this from the beginning. So if this is the PDF you want to estimate, you now don't want to estimate it with these kind of step functions. Um, even if you make um, the bin width smaller and smaller, but you want to estimate it with some continuous function that um, um, oh, that if this is the PDF again, that somehow estimates this continuously. Yeah? However, this is uh, done in, in detail. Yeah, it's a form of smooth histogram estimation, so you also find a discussion of kernel density estimation under the term smoothing. And again, it's uh, fairly old, <coughs> um, so the 50s and 60s. Um, so to introduce that, um, it uh, helps to first talk about something that is known as homothetic transformation of a random variable. 
um, which is just a squeezing operation of um, um, probability density functions. And then we need, um, again, the convolution of random variables like we introduced earlier. And then we kind of uh, go a little bit um, semi-formal um, by discussing the convolution of um, a probability density function with a direct delta measure, which if one wants to do it formally, one has to, there's a, some theoretical overhead where one always has to be careful about talking about the convolution of distributions and the distribution of random variables and then uh, um, looking what this means on the integrals and so on. And we will do this kind of uh, yeah, roughly um, because the theoretical overhead is not really justified um, for what um, and this thing is doing. And once we've done this, so um, so this homothetic transformation convolution and this direct delta measure convolution, then we can introduce the kernel density estimator um, because then the formula makes sense. And we can also um, talk about um, a consistency uh, theory for the kernel density estimator. Just checking whether my recording is still doing something. Oh, it's somehow oh, very hidden. Good. Just want to make sure that we have all of this on tape. Good. Then, after this introduction, let's go and continue this. So, the first thing is this homothetic uh, transformation. And uh, by this, uh, what is meant is that um, you have a random variable x. And it has a PDF, so you can also view this as the homothetic transformation of a, a probability density function. And you multiply um, the random variable um, or the values of the random variable by x. So this, again, refers to the transformation of uh, random variables. And um, here it's um, just um, yeah, a linear mapping for some parameter. And the question is, um, what is the... Um, um, random. Uh, what is the PDF of the random variable y? And we've done this already when we uh, discussed about linear transformations of random variables. Um, so it's relatively easy to show with the univariate probability density transformation uh, theorem that we introduced in the fourth or fifth um, um, section that um, the transform probability density function, um, if you apply this uh, multiplication, um, is 1 over b um, px at the location y divided by beta. Um, why we need this for kernel density estimation will get clear when we get to kernel density estimation. For now, it's just kind of a reminder that if you have a PDF, and uh, you um, um, put uh, the random variable represented by this, or the you put the random variable, the distribution of which is represented by this probability density function, you put this into a, um, a linear function, so you multiply it by b, then the PDF of what you get, um, of, of the thing that you have transformed, has this form. Yeah? So this is not really new, I'm just um, reminding you of uh, this. Um, what we will be using this for is um, essentially a, a squeezing um, um, operation. I will give you a, a drawing once I um, show you the theoretical stuff and we don't have to switch back and forth all the time. The other thing is convolution of random variables. Um, we also have seen that. Um, so also when we talked about uh, transformations of random variables, so if you have two independent random variables and you look at um, the distribution of um, their sum, then you can um, find the PDF um, by convolving the um, of the uh, summed random variable. You can find that by convolving the um, um, PDFs of the one random variable with the other random variable. And we've, in the Übung, we saw this um, um, 
yeah, kind of a longish uh, proof um, of um, the a more general convolution theorem based on, I think, on linear combinations. But a special case of this was um, the um, um, convolution, so where you just add and not multiply uh, again. And then um, the um, probability density function of the thing that comes out is given by these convolution integrals. And um, for um, the for kernel density and estimation, we need these convolution integrals where you um, basically integrate over some C and um, you put this C into one of them and into the other one you uh, put Z minus the C and then from evaluating this integral you get um, the um, value at Z. Um, yeah, and this is what we've seen. So it's just a reminder, pointer to the fact that we've seen convolution of random variables before. <clears throat> and this is the thing that I meant uh, where we now do things a little bit sloppy. So um, we are now thinking about um, um, convolving a continuous random variable x that has a PDF x uh, with a Dirac measure. And formally this is wrong because we have a PDF on the one hand and we have a probability measure on the other hand. Um, the Dirac measure does not have a PDF, um, so it's, it's a little bit wrong, but one can uh, easily, in terms of the convolution um, integral, make the point. So think about, uh, so consider this here, which we now call Dirac measure. So that's delta xj. And um, this allocates to each x in the real numbers, it allocates uh, a 1. If um, the x, um, oh, that should be an i here, sorry, um, because I think at one point I replaced i's with j's. So this should be, of course, all with the same um, uh, subscript, so delta xi. Um, this allocates to each x in the real numbers um, a number, and this number is either 1 if uh, x equals xi, or 0 if x does not equal xi. Um, and this xi is a fixed uh, number in the real numbers. And we are now uh, talking about convolving um, the probability density function of um, a random variable with this um, Dirac um, measure thing. And um, then we um, need to evaluate the convolution integral. And um, then the following happens. If you now think about uh, xi going over the real numbers, then of course this delta xi xi is zero all the time, so you don't have any contribution to the integral. And the only time that it's not zero, it's one, and it's one if it's xi. So then this xi here um, is xi, and the result of this convolution is then um, the probability density function of x um, evaluated at x minus xi. Yeah, so what happens is that um, if you think about um, basic functions, um, minus, if you put in a minus xi something, this then always uh, shifts your function uh, in x space um, 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 to the right if xi is um, positive. Yeah? So the only thing that is happening here is actually that we have, and why we need this operation is that we have a probability density function px, and we shift that um, to be centered, if you want, um, on xi. Yeah. So, and you can view this as the convolution of um, a probability density function with um, the, um, yeah, you can view it with the empirical distribution or you can view it with the direct delta measure uh, on xi. Again, once I show you, once I draw all of this for you, it will be immediately clear what this is all about. So, um, now the kernel density estimator. Um, the kernel density estimator um, it rests on a PDF, and this PDF is then called the kernel. Um, and um, to this um, um, PDF, to this kernel, we first uh, um, apply a homothetic transformation, so we squeeze the whole thing um, by this parameter b, which is then also called the bandwidth parameter. 
And then the kernel um, um, density estimator is defined as 1 over n. So again, for um, it's, what's missing here is a little bit, the, maybe I should put this in here, the random uh, variables, and then you have um, observations for them. Um, the kernel density estimator um, is given by 1 over n, the sum of the squeezed um, or homothetically transformed uh, kernels um, at um, x minus xi. And this is referred to as the kernel density estimator with kernel k and bandwidth b. So um, before I finally draw it, um, so what we have here is a squeezed and shifted version of the kernel. Um, of course, then centering on um, observed values um, xi. Um, and each of, and, and this is the most important thing, so all of these kbs here that I get summed up over the um, observed uh, samples, they are PDFs. So if you then uh, sum up PDFs, which all integrate to one, and you sum up n of those, and then you divide again by n, then you still have a PDF. And, uh, and hence get a continuous PDF um, estimate. So now let me draw that for you because um, I appreciate that the pure theory here is a little bit, uh, or not, not that intuitive. So let's go here and make a drawing. So what was missing from this last slide, because this is the same assumption as previously, is that we have um, a random uh, sample. So we have um, n independent random variables and we have an observed data set small x so. and um, then we have now observed some values And then the first uh, thing um, one needs to decide on is um, a kernel. And this means essentially any PDF. And um, typically ones are actually on one of those slides. So a very typical one, which I will now use is um, um, the Gaussian kernel which um, we here write as k because it's a kernel, uh, kx1, um, 2 pi, we take sigma squared to be 1, and um, we do x minus 1 half, sigma squared is 1, and we take the mu to be 0, so we have um, x squared. So the important thing, of course, this is a um, standard normal um, um, probability density for a Gaussian. The important thing is here not so much that it's a Gaussian, the important thing is that um, it integrates to 1. Yeah? So the uh, integral of the kernel uh, over the real line is 1. Then um, the other thing is that um, what we also define is um, this homothetic transformation. Um, Um, based on a parameter b, and um, this is just squeezing or stretching. So um, if the Gaussian kernel, of course, has um, is centered on, no, nah, that's not nice, is centered on zero, And then it has um, one, uh, no, uh, it has two standard deviations for um, uh, roughly a two. Yeah? And what this homothetic transformation allows is to um, now, based on B, squeeze or stretch this. And let's say we squeeze it, then um, we get to, for example, something like this. <coughs> 
no? or we stretch it and then we get to something like this and um, this essentially uh, corresponds to b i guess larger or smaller than one um, i would now have to actually check that from the formula but it's um, if you have b larger than one you stretch it or squeeze it I, and the other way around um, yeah that's a homework check that um, so that's um, but you do this for a fixed b and then you get um, the you get um, this kb that you see in the formula yeah and then um, the last so that so the red one here let's make this red These red ones are um, the squeezed ones. And then the last one that is in this uh, kernel density estimator is that um, you look at Kb at x minus xi, which you can either view as um, convolving um, Kb, so a stretched or squeezed version of a K, with um, the Dirac measure at the location of um, um, xi, yeah? or you can just view it as um, basically shifting the um, stretched, so the kb, um, I think it's a small b actually, the uh, kb to the locations of the observations. Ah, Jesus. KB. So, so what this then means is that you um, can, depending on B, you get um, different things. So let's say um, we take the Gaussian kernel and we squeeze it a lot or to some degree. And then we get this this uh, they should now all of course have the same width i'm trying to do that uh, so all of this uh, should be kind of the same width and then um, the kernel maybe i should write it up here the kernel density estimator um, um, kb i think it's how did I write it? K hat B X, um, which was defined as one over n over the data points n K B X minus X i says um, now you have this um, function over X which you get by adding up all these uh, shifted and squeezed uh, KB versions. So you would have to um, now add this and let's see whether I can roughly add this so definitely in this location so somewhere around here um, you have quite a lot uh, for the kernel density estimate and then you have um, basically spikes here uh, like this so it would roughly if you do this um, look so here of course nothing is happening so you get here and you get here and there you get a little bit of a bump and you go down again and then you get here yeah so that would be the kernel density estimate and the important thing is that it's a um, continuous function so if you think about doing this for um, a Gaussian um, where you have course many many observations Oops. or if you take more samples then you have many observations in a certain uh, area and fewer here and on each of those you put um, the kernel so here you have really many and then you add uh, those up then um, you get roughly to something like this, which is then um, where the um, Gaussian um, 
oh, it looks more like the Gaussian if you sample from a Gaussian. Um, the problem or one of the important things is of course um, the bandwidth parameter because essentially the bandwidth parameter determines the degree of smoothing. So if you, um, so of course with the um, bandwidth parameter you determine how much neighboring uh, data points co um, contribute to the sum that you get uh, from this. So for example, if you have a much um, shallower smoothing kernels because you because you didn't uh, squeeze that much but maybe even stretch the smoothing kernel then um, the whole thing will of course be um, smoother <laughs> um, the thing is to get a good approximation of the kernel uh, of the density that you're trying to estimate with the kernel density estimator like for the um, histogram you need a good uh, um, good bandwidth because either you have it very picky um, and then you have very many ups and downs of your kernel density estimator or you have it very smooth and then you have yeah and then you approximate things fairly smoothly and it's also not representing um, things that nicely of course, that's in the Übung. Um, the uh, task is to implement a kernel density estimator, and then we can look at that uh, to a certain degree. Um, yeah, but that's the basic idea. And of course, the most important thing again um, to um, remind you here, um, I didn't do that actually. So this would be um, this would be an unnormalized version because I didn't divide this by n. Once you added these things up, you need to divide by n, and then because each of these uh, little kernels um, is a PDF, and you add, and integrates to one, and you add up n of those, and then you divide by n again, this whole thing integrates to one, and you have the probability density. Yeah? So that's kernel density estimation, and um, the reason why I introduced um, the homothetic uh, transformation and the convolution before is to give a little bit of a reasoning behind this formula because you have here this uh, uh, um, squeezed kernel but you need to decide on the uh, degree of squeezing and you ha here have this uh, shifting which you can also understand as the convolution operation with the um, empirical distribution centered on a given um, data point. So. These are commonly employed kernel functions. So the Gaussian kernel, we've seen that, but you can also use the Picard kernel, which was invented by Captain Picard of USF Enterprise, and um, the triangle kernel, so where you basically have a triangle. Um, so um, these are commonly used kernels. Don't get confused there. Yeah? So with kernel density estimation, you're not using a Gaussian to estimate um, any probability density. You just want to have a smoothing function that integrates to one. Yeah? So that's the point. Finally, uh, in terms of consistency, um, Again, one can make a consistency statement, but here one needs to adjust um, the bandwidth of the um, of the kernel density estimator. And then one, um, so if this is adapted like the histogram uh, bin width, then one can show um, again that this is a consistent estimator by looking at the maximum deviation and the limit of many data points, the probability of having observation like this, and then this uh, that this is zero and the probability of observation being one. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is, in terms of kernel density estimation, this is also done in these Python um, plots like Seaborn. I think Seaborn really loves kernel density estimation. Um, it's, it looks nicer if you make a picture uh, than a histogram usually, but don't be under the impression that this is kind of more objective. Um, you have to decide, like for the bin width in the histogram, you have to decide for uh, a bandwidth, and uh, depending on the bandwidth parameter, things look different. So this is what I'm um, trying to say in terms of kernel density estimation here. Um, but yeah, of course it looks, uh, usually it looks a little bit nicer than doing a histogram when you present it because it looks like um, you have an analytical form. 
So if you do a kernel density estimator of a probability density function, then it does not look like a typical histogram with these bars, but it looks like you have a function and it's uh, like it's more exact, but um, yeah, it just results from adding together a number of functions. Good. Any questions about kernel density estimation? No. Good. Yeah, I think Seaborn does it. And again, you can prove that in Thunderbolt. Good, then finally, bootstrap. Is it quarter to 12 or is this? Oh. 10 to 12, oh, but um, yeah, okay. Um, because I thought it would be later. Good. Um, so what we've seen so far was non-parametric inference in the sense that we're trying to estimate um, a probability distribution um, using the empirical distribution by counting essentially and normalizing. And we've seen how to estimate densities, not by estimating some parameters of densities, so not by estimating, for example, the um, expectation or variance parameter of a Gaussian, but by, um, yeah, either um, using step functions uh, in a histogram um, or by using the smoothing operation in kernel density estimation. Now the bootstrap um, is not a method to do that at all. So the bootstrap um, is um, a method for estimating the variance of a statistic. Um, but it rests on the empirical distribution. Actually bootstrap methods um, can do more things. So if you have a variance estimate of a statistic, then you of course can also use this to uh, compute confidence intervals. And if you really go into the literature on bootstrap, uh, you can do more things uh, with it. Um, there's a very nice book um, by Efron who invented the bootstrap uh, after investigating what is known as the jackknife, something that we will look at at the Übung. Um, yeah. Um, we will only look at the bootstrap for estimating the variance of a statistic. And so we assume that we have a random sample x1 to xn from an unknown distribution. And this doesn't have any, um, so we don't specify any parameters. And now we're talking about uh, having a statistic. Um, so a statistic, again, being just a function of um, the random variables which not necessarily maps into the parameter space. And here we would also not have a parameter space because it's a non-parametric setting. And we assume that we're interested in the um, variance of this uh, statistic. And um, of course, uh, this would be, for example, something like the um, if the statistic is the mean, then the variance of it would be the standard error of the mean. And then you know that based on standard error of the means, we can build confidence intervals, for example, or we can do um, 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 tests. And we assume now that um, we cannot write down an analytical uh, version for this uh, variance. Um, because we don't even know any parameters of the distribution, so we want, but we nevertheless want to have uh, some yeah, measure of uncertainty or variability of the statistic. And then the bootstrap um, idea is to um, first um, estimate um, the distribution um, where, the stat where these random variables are uh, coming from, and then of course the statistic is also associated with by the empirical distribution. Yeah? So this is why we first, uh, this morning, <laughs> hours ago, introduced the empirical distribution. And um, yeah, so that's uh, the first thing. Um, so instead of looking at the variance of the statistic under the true but unknown distribution um, or probability measure, we look at the variance under the empirical distribution. And then, um, of course, if you, um, um, for example, think about the standard error of the mean. If you have um, one, if you make one observation, you can compute one mean. But usually, you just have one observation, so like ten data points, you can compute a mean. But you don't have um, because you only sampled this once. You have no way to now uh, give a, a variability of the mean because you only uh, had one observation to compute the mean. And then the idea is um, that you um, approximate um, the variance of um, the statistic of interest based on the empirical distribution by computer-based sampling. Yeah? And essentially, it will be um, resampling with replacement. Um, 
yeah, so there are nice books on uh, the bootstrap approach. The F1 is very, so it covers a lot of other statistics. This is a, a modern book and um, sorry. Yeah, and here we will in the remaining 10 minutes just briefly um, yeah, highlight certain aspects of why this works. But again, so we, you, you have a statistic, Kittle to be like um, a t-statistic maybe, something like that. So you compute a mean, you compute a standard deviation based on your sample, um, and um, yeah, you divide them. And now uh, you want kind of a, a variability measure for the statistic which you could of course easily get if you had multiple samples. So if you have 10 observations and then you make another 10 observations, you make another 10 observations, you always compute your statistic and then look at the standard, um, or the error of the statistic over these um, sets of observations. But the assumption is that you only have one observation like um, usually the case. And the idea is then to resample um, the um, empirical distribution. So what's the idea and why does it uh, work? So um, the idea is, um, and this is something that we will also see once we talk about numerical ways in Bayesian or numerical approaches in Bayesian inference. The idea is to, um, of course, approximate and estimate um, expected values by um, um, sample averages. Yeah? So this is here. Um, um, the law of large numbers. So if you have x1 to xm be distributed according to p, and um, that's always the same distribution. If you um, let um, the number of samples that you take um, go to infinity, then the average um, of um, um, the xi will go to the expectation of x. And here, and this is the thing that is um, in addition here, um, there's also a transformation. So um, so the sample average approximating the expectation of x, that would be just the sample average here. Now there's a transformation. And the good thing is that the weak law of large numbers still holds even under transformations. So this is something that you need uh, to know. And particularly uh, if f is the identity mapping, we've um, discussed that uh, many times. So the sample average of xi approximates the expected value of um, x. But also the, um, um, the um, normalized sum of x square um, approximates the expectation of x square. So um, yeah. the weak law of large numbers holds under continuous transformations f here. That's the point. Um, that means that we can compute um, the, um, or can approximate um, the uh, variance, uh, sorry, the, um, no again. That means that we can use the sample variance, which we um, get from um, squaring the sample mean and adding to it the um, average of the um, samples squared. We can use this um, to um, approximate the variance of x. Yeah? So this whole slide just wants to say that um, if you take samples, if you take m samples from a distribution and you uh, take that, uh, um, you let, uh, m go to infinity, so you take many uh, um, distributions, then you can use the uh, sample variance as an approximation of the variance of what you're interested in. And of course, we are interested in, in the variance um, uh, of a statistic here. Now, this is the slide that basically has the whole story about um, the bootstrap. Um, and the important thing that you need to realize about the bootstrap is how it creates si uh, samples, um, f um, independent um, uh, samples from the empirical distribution. So we want to describe the variance of the statistic Tn. We are under an unknown um, um, probability distribution. We already said, okay, we don't know this unknown probability distribution, we take the empirical distribution. Yeah? So we work now with the empirical distribution and want to use the sampling scheme. Now, Qn allocates the probability mass of one n to each data point xi. Yeah? So um, if you ask, so if you um, um, basically make the, if you look at the probability that is associated or the probability mass that is associated with a given data point, it's uh, 1 over n. Um, yeah. Now, one um, 
So, and that's uniform. So if we now um, draw, if you want to draw from this uh, empirical distribution and we take, um, or we want to draw a uniform draw from, no, again. If we take a uniform draw from our observed values, this corresponds to taking um, a draw from the empirical distribution. So we can um, create IID samples um, uniformly distributed according or distributed according to the empirical distribution, which is always a uniform distribution, by um, just sampling with replacement from our observed data. Yeah, so let's say we've observed 10 data points and we take one um, by chance, so for example, the sixth data point, then this corresponds to an IID sample um, from um, the empirical distribution. Yeah? And then when we do resampling again, we take another, IID, another sample from the empirical distribution. So we're sampling the empirical distribution. That's the point here. And we, uh, by, replay, by doing this with replacement, we do IID sampling of the empirical distribution. And then for each of those, we can evaluate uh, our statistic. And we can, of course, do our uh, sampling from, uh, with replacement many, many times. And then um, we can use the logic that was explained uh, here. We can use the um, sample variance to approximate the variance um, of um, the random variable we are interested in here, which is our statistic. Um, and um, then we basically have what um, we want. So the important thing here is that this uh, sampling with replacement corresponds to IID sampling of the empirical distribution. Yeah? Um, so by always drawing at random a sample from uh, drawing one observation from the observations you have, you do IID sampling of the empirical distribution. If you do IID sampling, you can use the weak law of large numbers and um, use the um, sample variance to approximate the variance. So um, you approximate, you here have the sample variance. By this, you approximate the variance of your statistic under the empirical distribution. And this you use to approximate the um, variance under the real distribution. And of course, um, so this is kind of uh, fine because you hear, um, so the empirical distribution has a certain variance and of course, um, you can uniformly send or yeah, you take samples IID from that many, many times, and then you describe your empirical distribution, usually quite good, but whether the empirical distribution has to do much with the real distribution, that of course depends on the number of data points. Um, yeah. So here's then, um, if you want to implement this, and I think somebody should for the übung, um, I think you all have to do it because it's a programming exercise. Um, you start with a data uh, um, set, um, and uh, then you um, sample um, um, n times um, with replacement and um, compute um, um, a sample standard deviation, and then you use this uh, sample standard deviation to approximate the variance of the statistic. Good. So now I think you're completely exhausted. And I don't know whether you listened at all for the last 10 minutes, but um, I wanted to put in the bootstrap because it's something that people talk about. So this is the um, summary again. And bootstrap is a little bit confusing. So um, because it's so, of course, from, from a data analytical viewpoint, these kind of permutation tests or bootstrap and so on, this is kind of nice because you can be like a programmer. You can be like, oh, I have some data and now I shuffle the data around and I don't have to write down any math formulas. I just uh, sample and, 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 and I just then compute it again and I do a for loop uh -huh, and I don't, uh, so let's code something, let's not do math. Um, but then the question is why one is actually doing this and what this is supposed to do. And then one has to do math uh, again anyway. Um, and with the bootstrap, one has to basically pay some attention uh, regarding these two approximations so that you, um, yeah, you get a good uh, um, description of the variance of the empirical distribution. But if the empirical distribution has nothing to do with the true but unknown distribution, then it's also not really that helpful. Yeah, so this was a little bit on non-parametric inference. Of course, one could do a full course on non-parametric inference. I'm also not quite sure whether I want to introduce histograms and kernel density estimates next year. 
earlier if because I think in the übung um, I always want you to do this um, so maybe it's uh, useful to introduce this earlier because um, then if I introduce it before we talked about estimators and statistics and consistency and unbiasedness all these things don't mean anything so it's also um, it's a little bit hmm, I don't know but maybe I will nevertheless do it so that everybody if I say run a simulation by using sampling and compare the histogram to the true but unknown probability density maybe that helps any questions um, this question shows that the um, with replacement uh, uh, with replace um, that uh, once you take the new sample um, you put in the sample that you took out uh, again okay so um, so you want to um, so you have 10 observations and um, now you want to create kind of a, um, a sample of that from which you um, compute um, your statistic to compute it. so you want to compute your statistic for example the mean um, or the RT statistic uh, many times but you only have like 10 uh, data points so what you can do if, is with replacement um, take 10 samples from it which means of course that um, so you let me it's much easier to, to uh, uh, draw this so you have um, that's too pink for me you have let's say five data points Um, and of course, you can compute the average of those. Let's call this M1. Um, it's it's weird. 1 over N, XI, I, 1, 2, 5. Sorry. Let's just call it N. So that's the average that you uh, compute. But now you want to somehow compute uh, some variability of um, this. And um, the idea is then that you um, create an artificial sample by sampling with replacement. So you need again five data points, which you sample from these. So for example, uh, with replacement. So for example, you now sample from um, these data points. So, for example, the first sample is x3, then you uh, sample again, you get x4. And because you sample with replacement, you get x4 again, um, and then you maybe uh, get x1 and uh, x5. And what you're doing here is drawing a sample from the empirical distribution. So, this is 1 over 5 um, here on the y axis. And this is your x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. So you take a sample from the empirical distribution um, with a five, um, um, so an IID sample of five data points from your uh, empirical distribution. And of course, this will then uh, lead to, of course, samples where you have repeats in them. And um, based on this, you then compute uh, the first average and then you do another one and so on and then you describe the um, variability over these kind of artificial computer generated samples and the funny thing is that um, this uh, um, works and uh, is consistent so you get um, uh, consistent estimators uh, for the variance of um, your statistic what um, um, there is uh, the jackknife that um, suggested to basically do this but um, without replacement um, and this is what F1 improved upon with the bootstrap um, to get consistent estimators but we will look at the jackknife also in um, the Übo. Yeah, so that's what this is about. So the, the, the funny thing and this is also what I try to say is that yeah you do sampling with replacement in the code, but what you're really doing is uh, uh, get IID samples from the empirical distributions. No? Anything else? No. Good. So that was then statistics for data science 2019.
and we continue in the new year with Bayesian inference.